Hi, my name is Karen Evans. I'm a professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk about multi-level stakeholder engagement. Um, as you know, within implementation science, having an active and effective um, engagement with your stakeholders is really quite critical, and we'll talk a bit about that today. Well, in implementation science, essentially what we're doing is we're taking um, scientific evidence and using it routinely in practice and in policy. And the first thing you have to think about is where that evidence comes from. And typically, we approach our evidence in a very rigorous manner. We think about um, it very often um, uh, in very pristine circumstances. We use randomized controlled trials. We have a lot of controls um, and uh, rigidity and rigor in our evidence development. But then when you think about where that evidence is being used, the typical approach to using evidence is really in places where um, there is not that kind of um, a control and structure. We often have very um, diverse um, audiences with a wide range of, of needs and resources and assets that they bring to the table. And often our evidence is used in places where there is a, a lot of context. There are many other things going on that may um, influence uh, particular individuals or communities or organizations response to the evidence that we're trying to bring forward. So engagement is really critical precisely for this reason that um, we have this sort of discovery process that unfortunately often sits separately from our implementation process and it is our stakeholders that can help us with that translation in ways that will increase the likelihood that our work will be effective. Just to sort of uh, dock us in what we're uh, talking about in implementation science, you know, very often on that evidence uh, development side, we're over here where we're thinking about how could a program work and does a program work. So in that regard, we're doing efficacy studies and then may move to effectiveness studies, still having that um, level of control um, and structure. Within implementation studies, we're really um, much more real world. We are thinking. Um, much more about how we take what we know and adapt it to other settings. And again, if we are sitting about, uh, going about doing that sitting separate from the end users, we are probably not going to be as effective, um, particularly in thinking about the context in which we're delivering these interventions, which our stakeholders will be incredibly important in helping us um, understand. There are some really nice lessons about implementation science that have been learned from the early days of the obesity prevention um, work. And this was a very nice um, review by the National Academies of Health, uh, uh, National Academies of Science, that um, looked at the um, basically that evidence base and what some of the issues were and why it did not translate so well to having an impact on population levels of obesity. Several of these factors relate um, very strongly to stakeholder engagement. In particular, um, a lack of attention to larger systems context, uh, understanding um, the environment, um, using policy initiatives, and certainly um, not using very many community-based approaches. Um, a very little attention to generalizability of results across settings and populations. Again, that sort of place where stakeholders become quite important. Um, focusing on a single intervention, often at single levels, um, often something that our stakeholders will um, understand may not be the most effective because so many of these challenges are uh, operating at multiple levels and a lack of relevance to the real world. So I would say that many of these um, uh, problems are the result of going it alone or really uh, trying to think about researchers doing this work without engaging stakeholders across levels and across settings. So it comes very hard to, to really get it right if you don't have that level of engagement. An example of not getting it right is this um, a wonderful slide, a uh, photograph from um, the efforts in uh, 2017 uh, by Congress, uh, and particularly the Freedom Caucus, to uh, rewrite the Affordable Care Act um, regulations around essential health benefits, particularly essential health benefits for women. And you can see in this slide that um, all of the stakeholders sitting around the table are men. And so this is an example where when you approach things without, extreme example I should say, um, approaching things um, without thinking about the end users, the stakeholders, the people for whom um, a particular topic is most relevant, you probably aren't gonna get it right. Um, the reason that stakeholders are um, so important is that they bring perspective 
they bring relevance to the issue, they have tacit knowledge, um, and this is really key. We spend a tremendous amount creating knowledge and evidence through our science, but people who are delivering um, care and in practice and in policy, they have tremendous knowledge that they're developing and building as they do their work as well. And we don't always have good ways to gather that knowledge um, because it comes about in different forms. So stakeholder engagement is a way to really tap into that tacit knowledge. It's also really important because of um, pragmatism. And um, you will hear, I think, quite a lot in your course about the importance of taking a pragmatic approach to our science. We often de develop and build these interventions that are extremely complicated, expensive, have a lot of moving parts, require a lot of um, high-level expertise to implement, and that doesn't translate very well. So when you have stakeholders working alongside of you, they can help you um, really have kind of a lens into when um, you're uh, really um, going awry in terms of being pragmatic and the strategies you're putting together are not realistic for implementation. So uh, true partnerships in our research and in our implementation settings will increase our ability to be pragmatic and uh, we will, in essence, be kept more honest by our stakeholder partners. Um, Con Cannon and his colleagues developed this very nice um, uh, framework about the who of stakeholder engagement, who, who comprises our stakeholders. And um, this is a very flexible framework, but it's been designed to really help you think through who are the whole range of people that um, I want to think about as including as stakeholders in my work. In this particular example, it's set up um, largely from the um, healthcare perspective. So your stakeholders might include um, patients and the public, um, either current or potential consumers of some type of uh, public health or, or healthcare intervention, and all that surrounds them. So their caregivers, their families, advocacy organizations, healthcare providers are a very important stakeholder often in the kinds of interventions that we do, both the providers and the organizations or systems that, in which they work. Purchasers, um, the employers, um, uh, the government, self-insured who underwrite the cost of health care, as well as the payers, the organizations that actually reimburse for health care. Um, policymakers, critically important in many um, uh, aspects of what we're trying to do. In some cases, product makers, um, device and drug manufacturers, as well as um, principal investigators, researchers who are um, critically important in terms of um, both learning from their research that might be relevant, um, as well as taking your research and, and, and going forward. Now, within selection of stakeholders, you also have to be very wary of conflict of interest and um, really think about developing formal processes for ensuring that you can deal with conflict of interest, even after someone may have disclosed where um, they might have a conflict. So you might have um, situations where people serve multiple roles. Um, you may have um, patients who are also leaders in an organization. And so it's important to kind of think about at what level you're asking people to operate at and whether or not that puts you in a difficult situation. So when you're um, selecting stakeholders, there are some um, important questions to ask yourself. Um, these include things like, well, Okay, what topic does the research address and what decisions is the research meant to inform? Who are the decision makers that are responsible for all of these decisions and who are the individuals and groups that are affected by them? And you can map these questions to the 7P framework and start to really think about um, at each level where um, you, you really may want to put um, most of your energy in terms of uh, identifying the best stakeholders. In much of my work, um, the end users and the target audience are always key. So for example, in work that we do in community health centers, we often are asking um, medical assistants or community health workers to deliver those interventions. So if they're the end users of my intervention, they are incredibly important stakeholders to help me um, develop it. And patients are the individuals who are gonna be the recipient of those interventions um, that the community health workers deliver. And so that becomes a very, very important um, uh, stakeholder group as well. So that's the who. Now the question becomes how. How do we approach stakeholder engagement? And Goodman and Sanders Thompson um, wrote a very nice article that defined three levels of uh, stakeholder engagement. The first, uh, what they call non-participation, which is really a very unidirectional approach where researchers may reach out to different um, groups, 
um, they're, the researchers themselves are kind of developing the intervention, they're implementing it, um, and then they may um, reach out to uh, members of the group, the stakeholders, to think about, well, how should we do our recruitment? We've got the thing here, but how should we um, roll out particular aspects of it? Um, they may educate the community about what the thing is and get some input um, in that regard. Symbolic participation is when um, researchers gather stakeholders together to assess key project elements. So the stakeholders might provide feedback, and then that feedback um, in turn informs the researchers' decisions. Um, this is a, a, an important strategy in terms of strengthening um, the research through community outreach and um, engaging and incorporating um, higher level input and feedback um, than you might have in a non-participation strategy. So um, this might include things such as uh, stakeholders helping um, get the project going beyond advice, thinking about the recruitment strategies, um, helping to interpret outcomes. And in um, many cases, these may be ongoing partners. Engaged participation really takes that up a, a notch and reflects really true partnership strategies where stakeholders are um, part of the team, they are collaborating in decision making, um, in resource allocation, uh, they have uh, equitable balance of power, so there are structures put in place so that uh, everybody has um, the ability to understand um, their role in decision making and um, the balance of power truly values input um, from everybody, including the community stakeholders. So this is sort of the range of um, strategies that we often see used. Um, unfortunately, I think we're often more on um, this non-participation um, range than we are in the engaged uh, level. And even sometimes when we think we're engaged, we don't necessarily have those structures in place that will facilitate true um, partnership. Uh, you may be um, very familiar with CBPR, which is sort of the um, highest end of that um, uh, very engaged uh, type of uh, engagement. But um, I just wanted to call this out a little bit because it's, it's very helpful to think about this continuum of community participation and research. Um, this is a, a diagram by um, uh, Meredith Minkler, who really talks about how down here on this end, these would be the, the non-engaged approaches. You have uh, what she refers to as helicopter science, where um, you really don't have much influence from the community engagement on the research design. Um, getting more into the symbolic um, area where you're getting um, some participation um, by the community and then all the way to community-based participatory research where you are have true, true partners. So this is a, an, another way to kind of think about that continuum and where you'd like to be on the continuum. Um, I, I wanted to call out um, community-based participatory research as an important form of stakeholder engagement. And even if you're not doing um, you know, purely high-end CBPR, there are some principles here that should influence everything that you do in terms of engaging with your community partners. Um, and this includes um, recognizing the community as a unit of identity, um, however you define the community, if that is a physical community or a community of people with a shared identity or um, uh, an organization that has its identity. Trying to develop cooperative and co-learning processes, an extraordinarily uh, important aspect of uh, stakeholder engagement is understanding that learning is bi-directional. So um, I um, am giving information and knowledge to my partners, but just as much I'm learning from them, and that is influencing the way in which I approach my work. Um, you want to have a, a, an eye towards systems development and local capacity building, again, making this um, a, a two-way partnership where you're not just trying to utilize your partners for the sake of the research, but also thinking about how does this research um, help enable the community to do things that are important to them. Um, having a long-term commitment with your partners is really, really essential, especially if you're in implementation science, because um, implementation science basically takes, um, uh, uh, occurs over a long period of time, and it takes a lot of time. And so if you don't have those long-term commitments, you can get started and not have the ability to continue those partnerships. Um, and um, CBPR also balances research and action. And this is where those um, co-leadership um, can be really helpful, because while you're doing research, there are also many active steps that can be taken to improve um, circumstances for the partners and for the surrounding communities. So that balance becomes um, quite important. 
there was a very nice study done by um, Norris and colleagues um, where they conducted, this was a very large qualitative study in a uh, clinical network in a large Canadian uh, provincial health system. And they um, went to a wide range of stakeholders, um, leaders, um, core team members, frontline clinicians, support personnel, and many others. And they used an iterative um, thematic approach to try to um, analyze the answer to the question, how do you define engagement? So they asked people across the whole sort of hierarchy of engagement and, um, and roles on um, how they thought about engagement. And the good news is that really regardless of organizational role, most of the stakeholders defined engagement through three interrelated themes. First, that engagement is active participation from willing and committed stakeholders with levels that range from information sharing to full decision making. So it's not just a matter of, I'm gonna download information for you or upload information from you, but rather this very active uh, type of partnership. Engagement also um, uh, centered around a shared decision making process about meaningful change for everyone around the table and particularly those who are most impacted. And then finally, engagement was defined as a series of two-way interactions that began early in the change process um, where exchanges were respectful and all stakeholders felt uh, understood and heard. And, and I would note that if you don't get that right from the beginning, it will be very difficult to have a strong and good um, stakeholder partnership going forward because people will vote with their feet and they will decide, I, I haven't felt heard, I'm not uh, considered, and therefore I may be wasting my time, and they won't continue the partnership. Um, there has been um, quite a lot of emphasis on um, stakeholder and community engagement over the uh, last uh, decade or two. Uh, this is a recent um, uh, article, a data from a recent article by um, George Mensa at NHLBI and others that have shown that uh, really even in the last um, decade, you had just this really um, a pretty steep uh, increase in the number of publications that talk about stakeholder and community engagement. Um, that said, uh, looking at the literature um, in another study done by um, Kim Cannon and colleagues, they, this was a couple years um, prior, about five years ago, they found that even though there was a, a lot and, and growing amount of focus on stakeholder engagement, there was little measurement of the trade-offs of specific strategies for selecting stakeholders or specific ways for engaging stakeholders. The um, types of engagement were highly variable in content and quality that the most common stakeholders are patients, so forgetting all those other levels. Um, and uh, actually, um, this paper found, this review found that there was less frequent use of stakeholder engagement in dissemination and implementation research than in earlier stages of research. Um, I suspect this is not the case anymore because there is so much emphasis in implementation science on stakeholder engagement. Um, I'd like to think we're getting better on that. I don't have evidence on that, but. Um, I, I think this has become a very, very important part of implementation science. And um, lastly, there uh, was a little reporting found in this review of how stakeholder views were utilized and synthesized throughout the project. And that's, these are really important gap areas um, for us to be, to be really thinking about. So some key questions to um, think about as you're doing uh, engaged research with your stakeholders are to think about in advance who will benefit from this work, um, who's involved in this problem from every level, um, uh, as I talked about earlier, those affected, those who may be addressing the problem, and those that um, have influence or hold power over the solutions to the problem. That will help you kind of think through who the appropriate stakeholders are to engage. Um, I wanted to give an example of this. Um, we have been doing some policy work with some um, key uh, partners in the advocacy world around looking at the federal requirements for the nutrition quality of the um, SNAP program, the Supplemental Nutrition Program. Um, this is a federal program administered by states, and stakeholders certainly include nutrition experts who can say, yes, the, the, these kinds of structures or policies within the SNAP program will um, improve nutrition. So, so they're absolutely an important um, stakeholder in this. But who else? Well, state program administrators who actually um, administrate the program and ensure that people in their state and in their regions have access to it and utilize it are really important. 
Retailers um, basically are the ones who offer the SNAP program. So um, you go into a grocery that um, offers the SNAP program in order to, to utilize your benefits. So they're a very important stakeholder in this. And in many, many ways, both in terms of um, the recipients of SNAP are their customers, and so they care about them. There are processes that they have to put in place that will determine um, uh, the way in which they are reimbursed for the SNAP purchases. And there are a lot of restrictions and things that they have to figure out how to manage in the course of their regular operations. Um, food manufacturers and distributors are also important stakeholders in this and sometimes have um, uh, opposing um, uh, uh, views or maybe uh, incentives. Um, and local farmers and food distribution system reps are also a very important part of this as are families who utilize the SNAP program and families who are eligible for the SNAP program but don't utilize it. So that gives you a, a sense of the very, very wide range of people who can be involved in what might seem like a simple or very focused problem. Then you wanna think about where your partnership is on this stakeholder continuum. Um, what the impact will be based on where you're focusing on that continuum and is that where you really need to be to get the kind of impact that you want. Um, uh, in our um, SNAP example, if we were just targeting, um, for example, the nutrition experts, we're clearly not going to get the impact we want, which is improved uptake of high quality nutrition among um, recipients in the SNAP program. Um, if you're very early on and you're in that continuum of engagement and you're mostly getting consultation, does that match your goals for impact? Um, will you be able to get the consultation that you need to support making the best decisions all along the way. Um, not just in program design, but how you would implement the program and sustain it. So these are really um, critical things. The more impact you hope to have, um, probably the more engagement you're gonna need. Then there's a set of process questions to ask. Um, and these are um, uh, questions such as, what processes should be developed and used for uh, partnership sustainability and progress along that engagement continuum? And how are you gonna evaluate the quality and quantity of stakeholder engagement? Partnerships are very much like uh, marriages and friendships. They require care, they require feeding. So you have to think about how you're meeting everybody's needs and the resources uh, are shared equitably and that the relationship is not one directional. The same kinds of things that you might be thinking about um, in, a, in a dating partner or, or in a spouse. Um, how do you ensure that everyone's contributions, both the person who brings the financial resources to the table as a researcher might be um, in the case of a grant, and the person who's key to those resources being utilized um, for the intended purposes and wisely, the community partner. Both of those um, perspectives have to be equally valued. Um, and uh, I want to close on a couple of um, uh, notes here related to how we engage with the partners that we identify and at the levels that we decide are the right levels. Um, this is a slide um, of comments that came from an implementation science consortium meeting that was held um, last summer. And this was a, um, a gathering of um, about 100 or so people in a room and many, many more people virtually, and people had an opportunity both in the room and virtually to write into a discussion board, an online discussion board about um, a series of questions. And this key question was, what is the most important thing we need to change about the current research to practice pathway? And you can see several um, comments here about partnerships and the importance of um, having um, partners beyond researchers, improving practitioner and stakeholder engagement, um, and, and how important it is to, to make those um, kinds of relationships. The most striking thing for me in this feedback, and it came up over and over again in many different ways throughout the um, consortium meeting, is um, how often we as researchers, without meaning to, are condescending in our partnerships. That we often approach things from the perspective of um, our status um, as uh, educators, as professors, we approach it um, really in a power dynamic um, and are often very off-putting to our potential partners. We don't develop reciprocal relationships as well as we might like to think that we do. So um, I think this is a really important thing for us to think about um, every aspect of how we approach people, um, the amount of time we give them to respond to us, how we set our meetings. Do we expect them to come to us? Do we go to them? 
um, just every aspect of how you reach out and engage in your partnerships all along the way from the first moment that you reach out to someone to the very end of having had um, uh, many uh, partnerships or engagements over a long period of time. Um, I, I think an apt way to end is to really think about humility um, and the fact that um, as we partner, engage, and embed ourselves in these relationships where we hope to have um, our scientific evidence uh, used and used to the benefit of all, we must lead with humility. If we don't, it will be to our peril and to the detriment of the populations that we're trying to work with. Thank you very much.